names and plant names all afternoon. And I've been birding with uh, Roy, so I've had a, it's been a real joy to have him here. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Roy. Thank you. St. Catharines Island is one of Georgia's barrier islands. It's uh, trying to make this thing work. You can see it's not too far south of Tybee Island and south of Savannah. It's about 11 miles long. Uh, it has a, a colonial history, a pre-colonial history. It has an Indian history, Spanish, uh, as well as uh, you know the, the antebellum period right on through. Mary Musgrove was the first person in the colony of Georgia to have title to St. Catharines Island. Mary Musgrove was over there as an interpreter and pretty much his agent in working out relationships between the English and the Creek Nation. She was Creek, her mother was Creek, her father was part Creek, part English. Her mother died when she was a little girl. She was growing up in Oak Mulvey, which is Macon today. And as a, as a young girl, she was taken to Charleston. So she was raised as an English girl in the best schools in Charleston. She was still a Creek Indian, and an archaeologist looked at her home uh, near Savannah, the home before she moved to St. Catharines. They found in the kitchen area silver spoons and deer antler tools. So she was fully assimilated into both cultures and was very comfortable in either culture. Um, she received a King's Grant of the island. I think, as far as I know, the only Native American to receive a King's Grant. And that grant was 22,000 acres, and it goes all the way this way and all the way around. So it includes this Marsh Island and this area and all these little hamlets and islands. And all of that is what the St. Catharines Island Foundation owns today. Most of the barrier islands in Georgia that aren't developed belong to the state uh, government, the DNR, Department of Natural Resources, the Park Service, or, or U.S. Fish and Wildlife. I'm not using this microphone. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Okay. okay. All right. Oh, no. You can't hear me. Okay. Oh, you... Can you hear me now? Okay. Uh, and so people are always asking me, do you work for the state or for the federal government? But I work for the St. Catharines Island Foundation, which is a private nonprofit that owns the island in that area that I just outlined, Mary's Island. Some say you can, some say you can see the face of St. Catharines. In, in this north part of the island. If you squint, maybe you can. Uh, after Mary Musgrove's death, Mary Musgrove lived on St. Catharines Island for about 14 years before she received her King's Grant. Uh, the colony refused to give her the land that she was asking for, and one of the things they said was, well, it belongs to the Creek Nation. It doesn't belong to the colony. She marched into Savannah with two or three hundred braves and said, give me St. Catharines or everybody dies. And they said, the lady knows how to negotiate. <laughs> um, and so that's an oversimplification. But she received the King's Grant in 1760 and died six or seven years later. Um, after her death, her third husband sold the island to Button Gwinnett, who signed the Declaration of Independence, was killed in a duel, uh, shortly thereafter, and the island went back to Mary Musgrove's third husband, who's named Reverend Bosomworth. And Reverend Bosomworth broke the island up into a number of holdings. The holdings were reconsolidated by the Wahlberg family in 1852, and it's been in one ownership, a uh, different ownership, but in one ownership uh, since um, 1852. Mm. This is, this is a creek, or it's a marsh, it's a marsh near a creek that uh, we know Mary, Mary Musgrove named Fish, Fishing Creek because it's on the original King's Grant map that she received. And it's interesting that people today call it other names. It has two or three other names that people use. But if you look at the old, early 20th century geological survey maps, they call it Fish Creek. So we're using that name, trying to ask scientists and people that write up research they've done there to use that name. So this was Mary's Fishing Creek and Salt Marsh. This, was Button this house is called the Button Gwinnett House. We don't know if he lived there or not. We do know that it's tabby, it's colonial. He probably did. It might have been built by Mary, but we don't know. But it's still called the Button Gwinnett House because he was the most famous person to have lived there. This gets into the antebellum period. This was a a chimney that boiled water to power a steam engine. 
and the, the uh, steam engine turned belts that ran a cotton gin. The owner of the island was able to sell his gin cotton in, you know, uh, directly to ships bound for England because it was a deep river that runs along the island. So he had a natural port to sell it. And that was um, Jacob Walberg. And he sold the island during the Civil War to a Cuban gun smuggler who was smuggling guns into the Confederacy. And after the Civil War, he continued to have agents going all around the battlefields of the South, picking up weapons and bringing them to St. Catharines. And then he was smuggling <laughs> guns back into Cuba in, in the coming revolution that was against uh, Spain. Um, he did very well. <laughs> He paid $100,000 for the island during the Civil War, and 10 years later, at his death, his widow, Anna Rodriguez, sold the island for $40,000. And there are even records that it has sold for less since then. Probably wouldn't happen today. During the, during the early 20th century, um, industrialists from the Northeast, uh, the, the, the principals of the Hudson Automobile Company, uh, purchased the island, and they added a huge wing to the back of to the back of the Button Red House, and this is that back wing. In 1943, Edward John Noble. I just, I just realized it says John Edward Noble. His name was Edward John Noble. Uh, um, purchased the island uh, to be a vacation home. Mr. Noble. As a young man, borrowed $4,000 and purchased the Lifesaver Candy Company out of receivership. Um, he, the way he turned the company around was that he, he was, his daughter told me that the candy tasted good in the factory, but was bitter at the candy store because it was being wrapped, wrapped in craft paper. So he came up with the little wax paper foil thingy that lifesavers are still wrapped in today. So then the candy tasted as good at the, at the candy counter as it did, and so it did very well. And he later merged that with Beach Nut and uh, purchased the NBC Blue Network, changed the name to ABC. And all that was merged with Squid Pharmaceuticals. And, and, uh, anyway, uh, before his death in the 1950s, he put the island that he had purchased in 43, St. Catharines Island, into the Edward John Noble Foundation. In 1981, the Edward John Noble Foundation gave St. Catharines Island to itself, and it's managed by a board of directors. Um, over half of those are descendants of Mr. Noble, and the rest are scientists, bankers, lawyers, people who are good uh, stewards of the island. Just another a view that looks like here, doesn't it? Yeah. Okay, in, in 1972, the Edward John Noble Foundation went into a partnership with the American Museum of Natural History from New York and was basically saying, we want you to run the research station. Well, the research station is still going today. We run, we run the research station, but we still have that relationship with the museum and that a grant is given to the museum each year and they in turn use that money to pay grants, start up grants and seek money for scientists uh, doing research on St. Catharines Island. And as, as Krista put on here, uh, they started with basic taxonomy of the island. They had plant surveys, bug surveys, bee surveys, butterfly surveys, surveyed the fish, counted the trees, you know, and, and all those kind of basic museum stuff. And then there, be, there began to be uh, other studies. There was a tick study um, uh, that went on for a decade and a half from Georgia Southern University. And it was, while that was funded, we provided the facilities, but the National Institutes of Health funded the study. And the ticks. Uh, no, we, we provided the ticks. We, we, we were happy to have them you know, take as many as they want. You know, they would drag these big cloths around through the woods and the ticks would all get on them and then we'd say, help yourself. You know, you know, um, the tick study was sort of out of my realm. So I enrolled in graduate school just to take some microbiology courses so that I could better understand how to provide backup for the, for the uh, acarologists 
who were uh, doing the study. But one of the things they learned on St. Catharines is why the Southeast does not have a serious Lyme disease problem where the Northeast does. And the difference is we have lots of skinks and snakes and they have lots of mice and deer. We have deer also, but the ticks, larval stage and nymph stage must feed on a warm-blooded animal uh, or, or the spirochete that carries the disease dies. The disease dies in the, in the tick if it doesn't have a warm-blooded meal in its first two meals. Because the tick has to have a larval meal, a nymph meal, and then it becomes an adult, and as an adult, it has to eat one more time, and then it lays eggs. So if it feeds on a warm-blooded animal all three times, which the chances are much greater in the Northeast because they're more mice, than on St. Catharines Island, or probably Spring Island, where there are more lizards and snakes than there are squirrels and mice. And so that was, that was kind of a cool study. They did a number of studies like that with other diseases, <laughs> with uh, other diseases that ticks carry. Um, another one of those studies, uh, I'm gonna go back a slide. There. Another one of the studies that went on in the early 70s, or in the 70s and in the 80s, was studying washover fans. Um, I thought it was some sort of plant when they first told me, these were geologists, so we're studying washover fans. And they said, well, you know what an alluvial fan is? And I said, well, yeah, that's where a mountain kind of slumps and it creates these fan-shaped objects out across wherever the mountain is eroding to. And they said, well, this is where the ocean is washing over the dune field and washing the dunes out into the marsh and filling the marsh with these fan-shaped structures. And uh, that is a washover fan where the sand is washed back into the marsh. The beach line is here, it washed over. Get back to where we were. One of the geologists told me very happily, he says, you have the best washover fans on earth. <laughs> and I said, why is that? He said, because this is the most erosional island on earth. And it's because of where we're positioned in the Georgia Bight. We don't get any new sand coming down rivers. And every, of course, every outgoing tide is a net loss. So we're washing away. So, but washing away. In 1974, the foundation entered into an agreement. I'm going to skip here just a little bit. I'm going to look, I'm going to go to this thing. They entered into an agreement with what everybody calls the Bronx Zoo, the Wildlife Conservation Society, to breed endangered species on St. Catharines. And at times we had three or 400 animals at any one time on the island, up to 45 species. And for 30 years, you can see the program lasted from 74 to 2004. Uh, endangered species were, it was probably the most expensive thing we did and the biggest headache, but also fascinating. Because, the, the, of course, the way to get an animal to breed, uh, the way to get an animal to breed is to make it comfortable. So we've got to figure out what ecological buttons to push so the animals will be happy. And uh, that was sort of a concept that as a biology, a bi biological background with wildlife training and forestry, the idea of making it happy uh, wasn't something that was part of my training, so I had to rethink because uh, the people who were best at breeding animals um, in captivity were people who talked to them, uh, not because the animals needed to talk to them, because the people didn't know the difference between the animals and other people. They just they, they were just trying to make them happy. Oh, he's unhappy today because of, okay, well, let's do what we can do to, to help him be happy. Um, we, had, we had a group of red-fronted macaws that were smuggled into this, into this country from Ecuador, and they were seized by customs, and customs brought them to us and said, we, you know, will you take care of them forever? And so wow. they, became, they became our ward, I guess. And we had a lot of animals like that that came from customs. Uh, and these were particularly endangered. No zoo had ever bred them in captivity before. No one had ever bred them in captivity. And we gave them nest boxes, just like we give other parrots. And we gave them a big space to fly around in, and they had a nest box. And they wouldn't go in them. <laughs> And the veterinarian from the zoo went to Ecuador to the watershed where these birds had once been because that area had been cleared and the birds were no more in the wild. And he noticed that the entire watershed was steep cliffs. And, the, and the, some of the smaller parrots or parakeets that were there were not nesting in hollow trees or going out into a hollow like a woodpecker, but they were nesting in root holes where trees had fallen from the, from the bluffs. 
So he came back and he says, you know, they were nesting in root holes. They were walking back into caves. So it's not. So we got the nest boxes, which were, big, which were large hollow logs, we plugged the hole that we had for the bird to go in, knocked the top off, hung it <laughs> sideways. We had three pair with fertile eggs in two weeks. So we made them happy. They liked to be able to look out. They wouldn't ruin the view. So we gave them ruin the view. Anyway, we had other birds that only nest in hot springs. So we built a hot spring. And the birds laid the eggs, and because we didn't know what temperature to incubate the eggs in. Well, the male tests the soil as he digs, and when he hits the spot that is the right incubation temperature, he stops. The female lays the egg, male covers it up, they leave. The chick hatches precocious, full feathered, and with a huge oh, wow. internal yolk sac that lasts three days. So the birds had to dig to the surface in the wild. Well, we didn't know if they could dig out or not or what or maintain that temperature. So when the male dug the hole and the female lug, or dug, you know, buried the egg or laid the egg, male covers it up. We shoot them out of the way. We dig down, take the temperature of the soil, <laughs> take the egg and put it in our reptile incubator. We didn't put it in our bird incubator, incubators for bird eggs, we put it in the incubator for reptile eggs in vermiculite and water and kept it the right temperature and we began hatching Nalios. And they're from Sewell, Lacey, and, and they led their eggs in hot springs. So those are the kinds of things that were enormous challenges. They were a lot of fun, but wow. Wow. we learned, and, and I don't mean by we, I mean on St. Catharines, I mean people have learned worldwide that you're not going to save wildlife by breeding a few of them in captivity. You have to save their habitat to save their homes. So the program ended in 1994. The Bronx Zoo left. They left some animals there, and I'll show you some photographs in a few minutes of some of our residents that were left uh, by the zoo. Now, archaeology also started in 1974. We'll skip that. Uh, this is David Hurst Thomas. I see he has a gray beard now. Uh, when he came to St. Catharines Island, he had just been hired as curator of anthropology, of North American anthropology, at the American Museum of Natural History at the age of 30. And I think I had started working on the island about two weeks after he started digging. And so the first person that I met that was not maintenance was this archaeologist. And my hair was a different color then also. Um, I think I was 24. And uh, we have had a partnership ever since. He's still working. But at that time, he, had, he was from California. He had just hired by the museum. He was very much afraid to come south. He thought somebody might get him. Um, and we explained to him nobody was going to get him. He was okay. Um, so he said, well, you know, I don't really understand this environment. I'm a desert archaeologist. I work in the Great Basin in the southwest. But I'm going to conduct an archaeological survey of this island, just like we do in the Great Basin. When well, the Great Basin, he would take 10 or 15 archaeologists, stretch them out every, you know, over 100 meters, be 11 archaeologists over 100 meters, and go four or 500 meters down the road and stretch out another 11, and they take a compass like a Boy Scout and just go across the desert. One of the deserts, the archaeology is laying on the ground. They catalog what they see, and you know, and then later they go chart and they kind of see where the village sites and all that stuff used to be. Well, you can imagine walking through the woods here and saying, "Oh, the Indians used to be here. And look at those artifacts." Of course, there are none. You'll see no, you'll see nothing if you walk through the woods here or on St. Catharines. So what he did was he threw a dart at the map, and it landed, I think, right up here. And he said, "That'll be our first transect." sort of a random survey. He's a statistician. He's also written statistics books as well as archaeology. So he took 11 archaeologists and they, they, started, they started walking here. They walked across the island. In every other step, they stuck a metal probe in the ground. And when they, and they got to where they could tell if they hit an oyster shell or a piece of metal or a live oak root or something else. In every place they found something cultural, they dug a test bed. And at the end of three years of walking every 400 meters, they would stop and walk a 500 meter wide transect. And you can see there are lines of dots on, on the island. Well, the lines of dots are where some of those transects are, where those transects are. So you can see that in some places, the whole thing was just a mass of sites. At the end of three years, they had found 135 undisturbed archeological sites, mostly Native American some Spanish pottery, and some antebellum stuff. 
Uh, well, that translates to about 700 undisturbed sites on St. Catharines Island. I have a feeling a survey here would probably come up with something similar, because I'm sure there were people living here for thousands of years also. So after, at, at the end of the survey, he, he's from California. In this part of the island, they found Spanish, they found Spanish artifacts. So it took another three years after the survey of starting with an area that was about the size of uh, what's 40 hectare. What is that, uh, 60 football fields? And they narrowed that down to 11 hectare, which is two and a half football fields per hectare, I think. Uh, so they're still too big to be digging in woods like you have here with chopsticks and little trowels and, and little brushes. <laughs> uh, so they, they, narrowed, they narrowed it down more and he found out about an instrument called a proton magnetometer that archaeologists use for like, hanging out of the ship or they or it's used for oil exploration, different things measuring the magnetism of the earth. And so they thought, well, why don't we just take this thing and see if since it's Spanish, maybe there's some metal somewhere. Maybe a building, maybe nails, didn't know. So a graduate student from Texas A&M who had a magnetometer, an old one, came and they set up a grid through the forest and every two meters he took a reading. And that took a couple, a couple of weeks for him to go through the forest to take a reading every two meters and then for them to be able to map it also. They had one magnetometer. But they realized that the sun moving in 15 minutes change the readings on the magnetometer in tenths and hundreds of whatever that little number meant. And that the anomalies that were hitting in the ground were hundreds and thousands of that reading. So every 15 minutes, you take three or four readings and then go back to the original spot and take a reading. And then with using the yellow pad by hand, they mathematically calculated out the error, take a few more readings. By this time, the sun had moved some more, they changed the readings and they had to go back. Well, this, like I say, took two weeks to take these uh, 100 meter square readings every two meters. At the end of the uh, two weeks of survey, uh, Dr. Garrison, or he's Dr. Garrison today at the University of Georgia, he was a graduate student then at A&M. Uh, Dr. Garrison said, well, we're through. And Dr. Thomas said, well, what can you tell me? He says, well, look, we haven't analyzed the data. We don't know how to analyze the data, but I've got a buddy back at Texas A&M, a graduate student, who's going to program a computer, big mainframe, using English, which we were all in a guy, oh, English, wow. He's gonna use English and he's gonna read this data, but it's gonna take him six months. Wow. And so Dr. Thomas said, can you tell me anything? And he said, I had three funny readings. So they dug three test pits and they came right down on mission side of Catalina de Wally. Uh, and, they dug, and they dug there for a decade. These palm trees outline where the mission was found. In 1991, I received a letter from a group of Franciscans who wanted to have a pilgrimage to the mission site Santa Catalina, Georgia's first church, probably the second in the United States. Um, the, the church then was a hole in the ground with the walls exposed, uh, they were in the ground because the walls were made of mud and when they burned uh, after the abandonment, after the Spanish abandoned the mission, when, those, when, those, when that church burned, the mud became ceramic. So the walls fell, and so they're still in the ground and are still, the, foot, the, the fingerprints of Wally Indians that smeared that, that mud up on those walls is still in the clay today. Mm -hmm. uh, three of the walls are still in the ground. One of those walls is at Burnbank Museum. And they have the entire west wall of Georgia's first church in the museum in boxes with the fingerprints of Wally Indians in it. Anyway, the Franciscans asked for a pilgrimage. We had a big hole in, hole in the ground here. There were lots of other holes in the ground. It was cactus and sandsburgs. It was a very inhospitable spot. We cut most of the trees in order for aerial photographs to be affected, affected. Um, so I, I told the priest, I said, you know, it's not a very nice place. It's not a place I don't want to go pray, except maybe for help. Um, <laughs> can you postpone it a year? And they said, we'll get back to you. Well, they, I didn't hear from them for a long time, but what we did was refill all the holes. 
And every place there had been a major support post that held up the church, we transplanted a palm tree. Oh, wow. And at, at that church, which is today a church of the Savannah Diocese, um, it's sort of, we're kind of treating it like the Arizona. It's still a church. Yeah. We've had three bishops give mass there. Um, we had a wedding 300 years uh, after it was abandoned. That was my daughter who was married there. Wow. Um, we had a funeral for 430 uh, Wally Indians and probably some Yamases from South Carolina also, because we know they moved there later. Uh, during the mission period, we know the Yamases went down seeking uh, protect, protection from the British, um, seeking, seeking protection from South Carolinians, no offense. But, uh, <laughs> um, but the, um, and so after the archaeologists looked at those people, uh, of course, how, what got the church involved to begin with is Dr. Thomas wrote to Bishop Lassard and said, I have something of yours and explained to them that the custom in archaeology then was that if you found skeletons of people who had no descendants, you kept them. They were put in labs, they were put in universities, and they were kept for study. The Wally Indians, we believe, then were an extinct people. I said believe then. Um, so, and so we explained that to the bishop. There are no Wally Indians left, but there certainly are a lot of Catholics. So we want you to help us treat this cemetery as you would any other Catholic cemetery, but we're going to do the science. Help us do it respectfully. Well, the bishop was thrilled. He came down and he came up with the idea to rebury the Indians after a certain time. Uh, do the science, but put them back, and he agreed to come down and bless the site and reconsecrate the church. And so that's what that's what happened. So that is the reconsecrated church, uh, Mission Sada Catalina. I have a question. I have a yes. Would you correct the date that I put as a placeholder? Oh. As the window, the, it gives oh. the impression it oh. was started in 1678. So. Right, um, yeah, right. Um, St. Augustine was founded by Menendez in 1566. So it's 1566. And a few months later, sailed up to what is Paris Island today mm -hmm. and established the town there, Santa Elena. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, before he, on his way up, he stopped on St. Catherine's and left some. Some, some friars, some priests, and uh, a few soldiers to protect the priest. So sometime after 1567, the mission was founded on St. Catherine's, but the exact date is, the exact date is not known. Uh, it's sometime in the next decade. We know that priests and soldiers and Menendez visited regularly, but we don't know when they started the mission. In 1597, the mission was destroyed during a conflict between different Wally Indian groups and two Franciscan friars died at the altar during this confrontation. Mainly, I think, because they were witnesses uh, more than because the Indians were after the Spanish. In fact, they were fighting over who had favor with all the good stuff the Spanish had. So the Franciscans who wanted to come on the pilgrimage wanted to come and visit the site where two of their brothers had been martyred in 1597. The church was rebuilt by Wally Indians um, in 1604, and they sent emissaries to St. Augustine and said, send priests. We've been five years without confession. And the church said, yes, and they sent priests, and that sort of created a, a series more Spanish missions to all get safe now. And they lasted uh, really until the missions were evacuated, fleeing from uh, Charlestown slavers and pirates that were raiding those areas and capturing people and selling them to North Carolina and Virginia tobacco plantations. Cool pipe that was found a few weeks ago. And this was this was not at the mission, it was near the mission. The um, thing on the person's finger on the left is the original Georgia peach. It came from the Spanish mission area. Um, so we so we it's a peach pit. And the chart here shows the different pottery types over about 4,000 years that have been found on St. Catherine's. And Krista called me holding a pot that I found rolling in the surf on the beach. Oh, and I had never seen one that intact other than some that the archaeologists had, had uh, dug up. But a shell mitten had washed out into the surf, had washed out into the surf, and that pot was, pot was in it, so I took it up to the lab and gave it to the archaeologist. <coughs> One of the things we do on St. Catherine's, besides um, research and conservation and education, is historic preservation. 
This is the building behind the chimney where the cotton gin was uh, during the antebellum period. This was, this was part of the industrial complex where he had his own dock and his own place to unload the ships. There are ballast piles in the river where the ships used to throw off the ballast to take on the cotton. And it's where it is now today our archaeology lab. We have an old tabby barn that is the best, best preserved tabby barn that we know of. We use it for the scientists to store. We have stalls in it for different scientists to store their equipment in. But we try to stabilize, stabilize and prevent from falling down, old, old buildings from falling down, and some of them we're using. Um, one of the slave cabins is being used today as a guest cabin. We have six, six other cabins that were built in 1929 that are copies of what the slave cabins had looked like. This is just archaeologists doing what archaeologists do, dig all the holes. <laughs> this is what, three weeks ago? In 1991, some Franciscans asked to come and have a pilgrimage and say Mass. They never got back with us again. And three weeks ago, a group of Franciscans came with some historians who studied the, the, the Franciscan borderland from Florida to California. There came to some archaeologists who also did the same thing. And I got, I got to sit inside what is now the church, a grove, a grove of living things, and listen to Franciscan friars say mass. And it was a, kind of a sweet moment for all of us who were there. So, so some of the things we do are a little weird, but uh, they seem to be okay. <laughs> These are our neighbors. Chris explained to me today the management of deer and the management of, of the land and the way it's done here. And it's being done here better than we do it. So I learned a lot today. And I, I was, I was uh, it's really been a good day learning that. Well, one of the things that happened when the zoo left is there were three troops of ringtail lemurs that had free range of St. Catharines about 30 animals. Uh, since then, that number has grown to 104. And it, it would be irresponsible as managers to let these animals go feral or go wild. Everyone has, everyone has a name. Um, they all have a, a physical once a year and break the plan. Uh, goodbye. <laughs> Doing 100 physicals takes six weeks. Because I bet Gary comes one day a week and we'll do a dozen or 15 at the most physicals. <coughs> These animals have to be caught. Well, you know, they climb a lot better than we can. They don't like being caught. Uh, so it takes a lot of bananas to get them in range. Um, so we, we, we like having the lemurs there. Our board of directors says we know it's not good management to keep them, but everybody likes them. Plus, these animals have been on St. Catharines about five generations. So they know all the foraging, they know when to eat, feed on what, they move into areas when plants are getting ripe or when certain flowers are blooming. They, they're as adapted to St. Catharines as they would be in Madagascar had they grown up there because they've grown up being able to roam free. They have right of way. All wildlife on St. Catharines has right of way. I've noticed here the squirrels seem to think they do too. They grow. That's okay. Um, a troop of lemurs will see a truck coming down the road and run to get to the road to sit down. <laughs> and they know how to sit down. And then they climb all over the truck, and if you have the window open up, they'll, you know, they'll come looking at you. And they, but uh, they, they have right of way, they know it, they exercise it, and people have to stop. In, in Madagascar, before the missionaries came, people were sun worshippers. And some of the lemurs they used as food, different species of lemurs they ate. But the legend is the people of Madagascar did not eat, eat ringtail lemurs because they were fellow sun worshippers. And if you notice, there they are. Some mornings there'll be 20 lemurs on the roof of our house or one of the other buildings, all facing the morning sun with their palms out. Morning up usually, but it, it, it looks like a moment of prayer and meditation. So interesting. Hmm. And, and the funny thing is, is these animals are not pets. 
we don't pet them, we don't, you know, we, we don't, we feed them, but even then, not enough. We want them to forage, we want them to behave like, like wild lemurs. Um, but, and I've, and I've read that in Madagascar, these lemurs will walk into a town, they'll go into people's houses, just like if we have no glass in the windows there, they'll do pretty much like they do on St. Catharines. But, you know, we can be doing something, and our activity doesn't bother them at all. They'll come up and just sit, sit down like this beside us. I had one that, that was ostracized by a troop, and so she would wait for the school boat every day when my kids got home from school. And they would get home and they were allowed to commune with her. They could sit with her or hang out with her, but they couldn't pet her or feed her. And they wouldn't, and she would hang out for about an hour and then she would go to her place and they would come in and do their homework. But, uh, and she was lonely and the other lemurs didn't like her, you know, and so she kind of grew off. But uh, her name was Kate. All the first lemurs had uh, Shakespearean characters' names. And it was funny to hear someone on the radio say, oh gosh, Rome Romeo's going to be alligator pond. And, uh, and Fal Falstaff was eaten by an alligator. And, uh, and, and we found him by following his transmitter. Uh, you can see some of these have collars, those are radio transmitters. And his transmitter was followed to an alligator den. And so the den was beeping, so we knew that he was in there with the alligator. Kind of like that clock that the crocodile and Peter Pan had. <laughs> Another thing we have, as I mentioned, is conservation, research, education, is we have field schools in the summer. These are students from the University of the South in the Iowa Ecology Field School, which has been going on 27 years or eight or something. Um, it's been great. These are really good students that come and they have a, I think they have a good summer where they work really hard. And the professors at the University of South tell me that when students graduate, they have to fill out an evaluation form. It's low point, low points, high points, best professor, worst professor, you know, all these things. And they said that one of the questions was best semester. And they said, to a student, every single student who spent a semester on St. Catharines said the best semester was their summer on, on St. Catharines. And, uh, and, these, this, and these kids have become, you know, we get letters, we get cards, they've become real fans and supporters, almost like a, a member base wow. for St. Catharines Island. Yeah. Here they are going to Bull Island to study plant succession. Bull Island has plants very much like Spring Island. St. Catharines has an overpopulation of deer, so we don't have the fabulous understory that you have here. I've learned a lot about what we need to do to fix that today. Sure. Exactly. Okay, this is also, again, students on the beach. We also have a sea turtle program where we protect the turtle nest, try to eliminate predators. Uh, because St. Catharines is erosional, remember I told you we're the most erosional island. Sea turtle nest, the incubation period on the sea turtle nest is longer than the period of time it's gonna take for the beach to wash away with the turtle lady egg. So we end up moving about 80% of the nests to higher ground. Wow, wow. We, we know when they're laid, which ones won't make it, which ones will, probably by elevation and also by substrate. This fellow, Dr. Bishop, is a, is a geologist, and he came to St. Catherine studying ghost shrimp because he was a hard rock geologist who studied ghost shrimp that are 300 million years old in the Great uh, Plains in, uh, in the Dakotas. He had 20,000 fossils of these ghost shrimp, and then he came to St. Catharines and began um, describing and catching ghost shrimp in the beach. And he says, because the, the habitat range is so narrow, so narrow for these ghost shrimp, his descriptions of St. Catharines and where they're living is that he's able to describe what the Great Plains looked like or that part of them where he found the ghost shrimp mm -hmm. uh, 300 million years ago. So it was a real indication of it. So you can see how, of course, the seas have moved and all that. But he became interested in sea turtles first uh, as a geologist because they dug those nests. And, and he realized that their nest, their nest was at a certain spot in the beach, also where heavy minerals settle out. And he had a contract with DuPont to help him figure out where to find heavy minerals or titanium on their property in Colorado. So he went to their property that was 8,000 feet in Colorado and he found two fossilized sea turtle nests in the face of 
some clips and said, your titanium will be like, you know, a few centimeters below this. And they tested in it, and it was. But he became, he fell in love with sea turtles. So he's been running our sea turtle program for over 22 years. And he is protecting the nest and he teaches students. And we have a field school each year. Of, uh, we used to have it all science teachers. And we feel like we impacted about, from the numbers, about 300,000 um, high school students and middle school students in Georgia by, by training these science teachers in conservation and in the protection of the sea turtle nest, making them really gung ho. They take all this energy back to their classrooms, and it's, it's a very exciting time. Last year, we lost the grant that helped fund that program. So uh, St. Catherine's Island had to pick up the tab to fund the school, but we couldn't have school teachers. Um, so we got uh, undergraduates from Georgia Southern, and it was even a better field school. So now it's something they can enroll in, they pay tuition, tuition helps fund uh, the professor's salaries that, that protect the turtles and teach. And we still do what St. Catharines does. We provide the beach, the housing facilities, vehicles, where they need on the island. And then we go to South, I mean, uh, Georgia Southern University will be paid for that. Many of the things, many of the things we do are cooperatively. We provide the facility, somebody else comes and does the work. St. Catharines Island Foundation gives no money to Dr. Thomas, who does the archaeology. He's been doing archaeology since 1974, and he still is. But up he gets grants from foundations and other places that pay for his work. Mm -hmm. We provide him with trucks, buildings, fuel, all that sort of thing, which is very expensive, but so it's a good match. But he's doing great archaeology, and there's been many books published uh, from the archaeology on St. Catharines. Uh, some people just uh, help, these are children helping move the nest and, well, this fellow is not a uh, child. Um, Paul is a retired Navy commander, and uh, this is a gorgeous little girl whose name I can't remember, but she was so cute, I had to watch her all day, along with her, her parents are really sweet too. These are my grandsons, uh, Broden and Royce, thanks, thanks Christopher for putting them in there, it's always fun to see my grandsons. And we saw your recruit today. We have built six ponds, dug six ponds, and in each pond we put two islands. And this is one of the ponds, like what, like what you did here. Uh, we, we found that the birds are using two of the ponds, and they're killing them with all the guano because it lowers the, you know, ammonia, it lowers the, lowers the pH, and it kills the trees. But we keep digging ponds, and so we have ponds waiting that when they kill this one and want to move, we have others. <laughs> I was telling Chris today that someone called me up from Harris Neck Wildlife Refuge where there are a lot of storks. And they told me at Harris Neck that they're starting to line the islands. And it occurred to me, what a simple idea. And so they're lining the islands to raise the pH so that when the birds lower the pH with the guano, it doesn't kill the trees because it's already been elevated with the lime and the lime doesn't, doesn't hurt the trees. So, That's a great idea. Anyway, I thought it was a great idea. So we're gonna try that this winter. The mission is right there, just in case you're wondering where he's on the island. We live here. The mission is there. Okay. Krista took this photo of a place. Um, we started getting larger and larger population of wading birds, not just wood storks, but egrets and herons. And we were wondering, where are they feeding? You know, how, because they can't, they can't feed in the ponds where the islands are because they're full of alligators. Uh, plus it's too deep. Uh, so we thought, where are they eating? And we assume they're going out in the marsh and they're waiting on tides. And so there was a, a 19th century causeway that had closed off some sections of marsh on St. Catharines. And so we said, well, let's see what we can do here. So we put in floodgates. We allow water to come in and trap in shrimp and minnows and, you know, good stuff to eat for wading birds. And then we lower the water to concentrate these things. And the, and these birds all come in there in large numbers uh, start feeding. Well, uh, spoonbills have started showing up now. Uh, they seem to like it too. And it's the only place on the island other than the beach that I've seen black terns and there are other birds too that I usually think of as beach birds, but they'll come into these areas when we're dropping the water and also and, and feed there. And that's just another conservation measure, just trying to, to help the birds that are there to, to get enough. Mm -hmm. We work with the Georgia Department of Natural Resources in protecting 
um, oyster catcher nest. Uh, we have them on the beach. Um, I, th I think those things mark where some of the nests are. We also have these shell beaches along the intracoastal waterway with the big piles of oyster, oyster shell that wash up naturally. There are more oyster catcher nests on those than there are on the beach. Um, the problem there is that raccoons were getting the eggs on the beach and on these shell eggs. Fortunately, oyster catchers live a long time. They probably would have already been gone. Um, but what the DNR started doing and what we started doing with some of our staff is going out and taking the eggs away from the birds and leaving them wooden eggs that are painted to look like theirs. Well, the wooden eggs begin to disappear, so we pin them to the ground with a piece of string, and the birds sat them, and the birds would sit on them, and we would incubate the eggs in our incubators. And then we'd go back as they're hatching. But remember, this is an oyster catcher. This is a bird that knows how to open an oyster. I'm still not very good at knowing how to open an oyster, so I'm not sure I could teach a bird how to do it. So we take the chicks back and put them down and take the wooden eggs as the chicks are hatching. There you go. Uh, and, and about half of those get eaten by raccoons, but only half, where before we were losing all. Every single wooden egg that we have retrieved has tooth marks in it from raccoons. So the first, the first year, 10 oyster catcher hit, hit chicks fledged from Liberty County, and it did the first time probably in decades. That we survived. So we're, we're very pleased with that. And we're still working with the state. They have an intern that they have hired, and we're housing him and providing with a boat and a vehicle. And he's doing this work for the state on St. Catharines this summer. Uh, we've had studies, uh, painted bunny nesting studies. Um, one scientist studied uh, painted bunnings along a marsh edge and back into the woods about 100 meters. And he found that male painted bunnings who were very aggressive and would stake out a territory right on the marsh would have as many as three mates and he would raise three clutches of eggs in the summer with each mate. So a male that was strong enough to hold a section of marsh edge would have nine clutches in the summer. 50 meters back into the forest, a mate would have one, uh, a male would have one mate, and she would raise three clutches, maybe. So this male who wasn't tough enough to live on the marsh um, had only three clutches that summer. If you go another 50 yards back into the forest, it was one male, one mate, one clutch. It's about all they could manage to raise. Because the forest is more, it's a more dangerous place and there's less food. The, the difference is when the painted bunting chicks are hatching, the grasshoppers are really, they're, Kind of a salt marsh cave that are in, in the billions in the marsh. And that's a lot of that's a lot of protein to raise young with. And so the birds go out, even though painted buttons are seed eaters and go to, they'll go to bird feeders, when they're raising young, they go to the marsh and get grasshoppers. Just like hummingbirds don't feed their young sugar water, but they feed them mosquitoes and gnats and flies. Right. But they feed themselves the sugar water because they like it. But the babies get the good stuff. There are six bald eagle nests on St. Catharines, so that we monitor that every every winter when they're nesting. Oh. Okay. In uh, 1985, um, this guy, Emil Urban, uh, vol volunteered to manage our Christmas bird counts. Um, this last December was his last. Uh, he did not make it to the bird count. But he and I were in constant where he gave me instructions on how he wanted the bird count run the whole time. And he died in January. And he was a very good friend and he's a very well-known ornithologist. He uh, was a Callaway chair professor uh, in Georgia, which was, that's a, a really big inducement to be a professor in Georgia. It's a lot of extra research money and also even travel money and that kind of thing uh, to be a Callaway chair. He, um, when he, got a, when he finished his PhD, he became a professor at Haile Selassie University in Addis Ababa in Ethiopia. And he um, is the only person I know who ever took an emperor birdie. And when Haile Selassie met him, he, he asked him, he says, have you learned my language? And he says, no. He says, my wife's learned your language. And, uh, and he says, but I've learned your birds. And he wrote the first checklist of the birds of Ethiopia, and he published lots of papers on birds of Ethiopia. And the first, the first National Geographic I ever saw at 16 was about him. 
And when I met him years later, I, and he was saying something about working with pelicans in, in the Rift Valley, and I said, oh, I saw this great documentary one time, and I was telling him all about this documentary that I saw with this pelican project in Ethiopia. And he kind of looks at me and he goes, that was me. <laughs> but, uh, so anyway, he was kind of a hero of mine, and I had a great friend. Uh, I just want to thank I'm glad she found the slide. Uh, one thing I didn't say about him, he spent 40 years writing, he and two others, writing the first complete works of the Birds of Africa. It takes up about that much of my bookcase, seven volumes as well. And uh, it was internationally written, whose comrades, so the artist and, and one of the other authors were English, and none of them was American, and they would go back and forth. And, and uh, it took them that long to from the inception. And the reason they started it is that Prince Philip, when he took Prince Philip Bird, Prince Philip said, you need to do a book on the birds of Africa. Went, okay, that's a good idea, let's do that. So they, they start. Anyway, this is a plant survey in an area that's been about 360 acres that we manage exclusively for gopher tortoises. And these people, uh, one of them is one of Krista's interns, and two others are PhDs from Mississippi who study gopher tortoises. And this is a, a nutrition survey that they're doing to understand the nutritional value of the plants that the tortoises are eating. These tortoises were not on St. Catharines. We know they were there 4,000 years ago, 4,500 years ago from archaeology sites, um, but apparently the Indians wiped them out. But in 1992, the state of Georgia asked us if we would be host to a colony of gopher tortoises. It was the largest breeding colony known in Georgia and it was in Statesboro, Georgia, and a large uh, Walmart distribution center was that we built on top of them. And so the state captured the animals, brought them to us. We had some good habitat. We built a lot of starter burgers, uh, burrows for them. They liked the burrows we started. Some of them, they used them. Uh, and they stayed. And so we had then 76, I think, adult animals and about 25 young ones. Now we have several hundred adult animals because it's been since 1992. And we don't know how many young animals we have, but the, the habitat's good. Every single animal that we check, that we check, we would do health checks twice a year uh, on as many as we could find or catch, which is no more than a third of them at, at any one time. But every single animal gained weight for two years and we're coming to the sick and then, then they leveled out. They were in a bad spot where they were, where they were. And that's a gopher course. How big are they? Uh, Army helmet. Something like that, yeah. Half of basketball. They have, they have great personalities, too. For, you know, first time I heard people talking about, oh, these are great turtles. I'm like, okay, aren't all turtles turtles? But some of these animals have such personality that we get to where we recognize them. Of course, also where they live, they have burrows. So some you kind know, of near a burrow. But, but some are very curious, and they come out and watch when we're doing stuff. Others. We never see, but we know they're around because we can see where they've been grazing. So, interesting, interesting animals. This is their home, North Pasture, and it was a cattle pasture in Bahia, up in Bahia Grass uh, up until we removed the cattle in 1976. We caught and removed 600 uh, Black Angus and Brahma Cross cattle um, then, and we do burns in this area. You can see how thick the longleaf pine seedlings are. So, yeah. A gopher tortoise needs sunshine. If we allow, if we allow all of these longleaf pine seedlings to grow up, which are seeded naturally, we didn't plant them. Um, the gopher tortoise will starve to death because they have to have sunlight to warm up the enzymes in their body to digest food. Remember, they're cold blooded, so they have to be warmed up in order to digest the food. So. We want longleaf pine to return to the north end of the island, and it's returning, but we don't want it all to grow up as a weed in one, one, eight, one age. So we mow big areas of the pasture so the tortoises have sunlight. But where there's a fallen tree, a stump, a hole, anything that might endanger the guy driving the bush hog, we can just drive around it, make it easy. Uh, and so he does, and so we have patches of longleaf pine stands all over this 360 acres. Mm. So we're getting a mixed age forest coming up just by the way that we're managing for the tortoises. Great. This is a blooms of a milkweed in North Pasture. That's probably not 50 feet from a gopher tortoise burrow. 
Crystal loves to photograph butterflies, and she's very good at it. This is one of what all these photographs are hers. All right, the Central Depression Consortium. It is not a mental health group. Um, it, is a, it is a group of us, geologists, archaeologists, and others, who we banded together to try to understand um, a depression down the center of the island. Uh, most, most of all the springs that, that were on the island came up in that area, in fact, or along that line, and, and there are other things. Um, it looks like that what, they, what they're coming up with is there was a collapse um, 100 million years ago, maybe more, of the limestone below, and it created a crack uh, and, a, and a depression. And that, was when, that was when the island was part of the upland, and, and the ocean was probably out of the, where the Congo Shelf is today, which is about 200 miles from the shoreline now. Um, so anyway, that's, a, that's been an interesting project. And we had archaeologists looking at it. Uh, and the reason we have archaeologists working with geologists is the island separated from the mainland and became an island geologically, I guess you could say, 5,000 years ago. And Dr. Thomas, the archaeologist, likes to say people got there this next day. It looks like islands were washing away to the east and they just were island as land, as land washed away they island hop. Hopefully we won't have to do that. But uh, anyway, this is a guy studying the vibra core that we cored into one of the ponds. And he's He's a geologist from Georgia, Georgia State. Okay. I want to show you this next photo. This is a shallow pond called Beach Pond. When I first went to the island, it was full of water and had cattails in different places, maybe two or three feet deep. And the ocean was not visible from this pond. This is Beach Pond today one year after the previous photo was taken. You can't see the ocean. Um, the land is washed away. It's probably lost uh, 200 meters since I went there first in 1971 along this spot in other places more. And, so, and, and the large freshwater ponds that were on the southern of the island are all now salt estuaries with the tide flowing in and out. Another problem that this is causing with the ocean rising is that the archaeologists have always worked on the island and said we can leave a site and it's safe because St. Catherine will protect it. Uh, today, we'll protect it from people and from intruders, but we can't protect it from the rising sea. Mm -hmm. And that's a tree that fell and exposed an Indian cemetery. Uh, as, the, as the water was, is, as, as trees are falling into the creeks and things are eroding. We have ero erosion affecting archaeology sites all the way around the island. So those are the kinds of things that we're facing today. But there's still a lot of coot birds there. Thank you. Awesome.